Well, hello there, and welcome back to Mother Academia. So today I want to continue our conversation from last time, which was all about humility in Mother Academia. And if you didn't catch that one, I'll go ahead and link it above for you so you can kind of catch up because part two today, we're actually going to be talking about contemplation. And this two part series was partly inspired by a wonderful comment left in Common House for our Mother Academia cohort by a lovely lady named Teresa, where she was reminding us and encouraging us to not tip into basically book gluttony or audio gluttony, that with our pursuit, with our intentional courses of study, it would be just as easy as it is with any reading or reading plan to constantly be filling ourselves with beautiful, great works. That's actually a problem. You can become disordered even in your love for knowledge, which actually used to be the vice of curiosity, I learned in an interview I did the other night. So uh, we don't wanna do that. Her encouragement was to make sure we are leaving quiet time for contemplation. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. How can we make that happen as moms who are busy, who have little kids, who are homeschooling, which means our houses are always filled with people, we are never alone. How do we do that? Because it's a quick knee-jerk reaction to say, I can't have quiet, when am I supposed to do that? But contemplation is necessary for learning. So we're gonna talk about that, I'm gonna give you tips there, and then I'm actually going to pull up the glorious database that people love to look at in Notion with me. I love to look at it too. And we're going to update it because I finished some books. I've gotten sidetracked with some books and no one is surprised by either one. But before we do that today, I want to tell you about our sponsor. I think my kids are going to watch this and be like, I thought we couldn't sit on the table like that. So today's sponsor is Davenant Hall. They are the educational wing of the Davenant Institute and they are refounding the medieval university for the digital frontier. And every mother academic just put a check in her medieval box because the medieval age seems to be a thing we're all really into this year. And you know what? The medievals loved contemplation through spaciousness, but we'll get there. So Davenant Hall is a place for us academics, whether we are the formal type and we want to go through something like their Master of Letters program, or if we're the mother academics and right now we're looking to audit a class, which is my favorite because it means all of the learning and none of the assignments, which means that you can attend class and not feel bad at all that you are in your wool socks and slippers. But whether you are interested in literature and philosophy, which is kind of our jam around here, or if you want to study church history and biblical studies, they definitely have a class for you. And I say this as someone who will be taking a class next term called Trinity Term. And I will be studying with Dr. Hoskin in his early Christian worship class. So perhaps you want to join me in that one, or perhaps you'd like to go through their course catalog and look at their amazing options that they have covering so many noble ideas and worthwhile pursuits. Registration is currently open for next term. It starts next month and registration closes on March 29th. So they've been very generous to offer a $25 off discount for the auditor's fee, which makes it $200 to take a course. And you can make that happen by using the code commonplacetrinity24, which I will put right here, so that you can have that discount as well as then receive after registration closes a copy of Reimagining Classical Education. I would love to see you there next term. I will actually be there next term. I was really delighted by this sponsorship. It's exactly what we are trying to do with Mother Academia, continue with our self-education from our homes, but in a way that's excellently done. And so I give you guys David at Hall, check them out. Have you ever noticed how many people will tell you they had the best idea ever in the shower? It's because it's one of the few places in our modern times where the sounds, the input, the social media, the iPhone can't follow you. It's usually, oh, there are those dang shower speakers. Okay, barring the shower speaker, I know there are speakers that can go in the shower. Let's pretend like they can't because it's one of the last sacred places of quiet in our time. But when you hop in the shower, when you go somewhere like that, you're quiet. Your mind is able to wander freely. And that is actually incredibly important in learning. We know that learning involves the science of relations, which is this idea, and the phrase is weird, but it's from Charlotte Mason. And basically it's that ideas have relationships between one another. This, this is a medieval idea that the entire cosmos harmoniously fit together. The medievals loved to order and organize things. They did not have highlighters, but I think if they had, they would have loved them. But they really were, they were orders. They liked to find how things fit together. They liked to put them in hierarchies. They liked to categorize. They were our type of people, homeschool moms. But the thing is they saw the world as ordered. They saw that it made sense and you could make sense of it. You could study it 
find patterns, find ways that man ought to pattern himself after it. All these beautiful, lovely ideas that we really don't hold to today, which is a shame. And it was something that was really beautiful. And I think this is kind of what we do with our science of relations. We are trying to find the relationships between ideas, see the connections, see how things fit together. But in order to do that, you must have quiet. Your, your mind must have time to work. That's why actually sleep is really important. Your mind does a lot of this while you sleep too. But we know this for our kids. And I'm just going to start with that because a lot of times moms forget that what we protect and provide for our children, we also need. And as we talk about self-education, you can take a lot of, you should be taking most all of your educational philosophy for your children and applying it to yourself. And this is one of those things. We think it's really important for our kids to be outside in the hammock, staring at the clouds. That's necessary for learning. They narrate with us and they leave. Those ideas keep going. And it's like a seed. We use all the garden metaphors, the food metaphors, because they're helpful. They're limited, but they're helpful. It's like a seed that's planted. You don't always see what's going on. In fact, you don't see at all what's going on under the soil until there's a little shoot. And then you watch the plant grow. You watch the fruit come. And ideas are like that. We send our kids out. We say, go play, go be bored. These sorts of things, because we know that time, that space is necessary for their learning to continue. And yet we mothers don't give it to ourselves. So let's quickly, Talk about five or six, we'll see where we go with this, ways that you can actually in create, protect, and make sure you have that sort of quiet time as well. So that all of this reading and studying has time to work in your mind, work on you. Because ideas are crazy little things. If you read Charlotte Mason, they seize you, they change you, they do something to you if you let them. Okay, so the first thing, and it's really important to me, is to understand the why behind it before we get to the practicals. And that's that your soul, its job is to perceive and to contemplate. And therefore you must have the spaciousness or the quiet solitude. I don't even wanna say solitude because moms don't get that, but almost internal solitude. You are not allowing your attention to go in other places. You are not taking other things in. That must happen for perception to occur for the soul to have time to contemplate. That's the why, and if you think it's that important, if you tie it into your soul, think of the tripartite soul, so we're talking about your rational mind, your spirited chest, and your repetitive belly, and you want your mind to learn how to rule the belly through your chest so you can live a life of virtue, right? Like these are things that are kind of 101 for commonplace if you've been with me for a while now. And in order for that to happen, this must be a thing. And I think when you make it that important, when you're like, oh, I will not learn to the same degree, I will not be shaped by or formed in the direction of to the same degree, then you start to protect it. And this is something that has to be protected, in my opinion, the same way you would protect like your morning Bible time or your family prayer time. It's, it's an imperative, it's important, and it must be protected. So the very first tip I have is don't make the easy reach. In motherhood where I am, I know not all mother academics are in the same season I'm in with little kids, but it's very easy and tempting and culture will confirm to you that your life is hard and bad. You do mundane things repetitively. Everyone's crazy and screaming because they're all diaper clad and what have you. And so you need an easy thing. Everything else is hard, so here is easy. It's easy to scroll. It's easy to online shop. It's easy to binge trash on Netflix. It's easy. Don't make the easy reach. When you in a moment find that you have just a breather break, don't go for the phone. Don't go for the uh, dull idea. Mason talks about how children are very turned off by the dull ideas that adults think about, including <laughs> she always lists clothes, which always makes me laugh because there's this like huge emphasis on linen dresses in the Charlotte Mason world. I'm not in one today. I love them. So when I poke at things, no, I'm usually poking at myself too, but there's such this emphasis on the clothing aesthetic in a Mason homeschool. And Mason is always ragging on women who think often about their clothes and talk about their clothes a lot. So anyways, the children, her point is, would be embarrassed by the dull ideas of adults because we're not still engaged with what's wonderful in the world. And so if you've been reading these amazing books, like you've been working through these things, you have ideas to think about. You can actually sit by the window, and this was Teresa's encouragement, and watch the rain fall and just be mesmerized by the beauty of what's happening as rain falls. Your mind will then start going with ideas and things you've been reading. It'll come, but you're allowing there to just be enjoyment and delight of something natural. The natural world we'll talk about in a second. That's another big tip of mine, but don't go for the easy thing. Wait, pause, take a breath, feel your body, put yourself in your place. Like, okay, 
here's what's happening. I think in early motherhood, there can be a lot of sound, a lot of movement. Sometimes it feels very chaotic. And when you get a second, you want to, in some in some sense, escape. Like that's what the easy, the easy fix is. Even if it's not the phone, it could be like a snack that's gonna make your blood sugar crash. It could be another cup of coffee really quickly because you think you can't make it. It could be all these things. It doesn't just have to be the phone. It's just the common one for our time and place. But just wait a second. Don't make that easy reach. Pause and maybe do the uncomfortable thing of feeling your your current moment. Okay, I'm feeling a little stressed. I'm gonna go outside and I'm gonna like smell the fresh air and listen to the birds for a second. I'm gonna sit by the window and I'm just gonna look at the clouds pass by for a minute. Do that thing that maybe doesn't feel like the, the fix you're looking for or the break you need and just sit in the moment and take a second. It's a small practice. It may only be a couple minutes at a time with little kids, but it does add up as a healthy way to come back to reality, which is the next thing. So reality is key in all of my work and in the work of life. You are constantly learning to conform your soul to capital R reality, to steal from C.S. Lewis as I always do. And that was the work of old. The cardinal problem had been, how do we help conform the souls of our students and ourselves to reality as it actually is? That's what Mother Academia should be doing for you. It should be constantly changing the contours of your mind so that you are having a clear picture of what the good life is, so that you are pursuing it through right practices, and that you are delighting it with real love and sharing it with others in a life-giving way, right? That's what all this we hopefully think will happen at the end of it, right? That's what we're hoping for. And so you need to then not be exiting reality. And I cannot remember the stats on this. Someone else might know, but one of my good friends shared with me a couple of years ago that every time we go from looking at a screen back to what's happening, depending on the amount you spend time-wise on the screen, it takes a certain amount of time to re-engage reality fully. And it was something like, for, I'm gonna guess here, please, I'm guessing. Everyone hears me, I am guessing. It was as bad and shocking to me as something like for every minute you spend on the phone, it takes five to six minutes to fully re-engage in what's happening. So when you pick up the phone very quickly when you walk into the kitchen and you scroll for three minutes, you could then struggle to re-enter reality with your children for 15. It was something that drastic. Again, I didn't say those were the exact numbers, just there was something like that. Don't put yourself in the position to have to re-enter too often during the day. Yes, we get a phone call. Yes, our husband asks us to make a purchase or follow up with that email or something. And those are parts of our day. I'm not demonizing the fact that we occasionally have to be on a screen to do something in our modern age. Just reduce the amount of re-entry so that you are constantly not being jarred by reality. How will your mind have time to contemplate lovely ideas, let them connect, let them become things that come out of your fingertips if you can't even get your bearings with your kids scrambling around, with the homeschool day starting, with someone shooting someone in the eye with a Nerf gun, which never happens here at my house. The next tip I steal from Wendell Berry, and that is to practice resurrection. That when things feel hard and awful, rather than thinking, how can I get control of this as soon as possible? Who do I need to like shout over to get their attention? How can I make this never happen again? What toys do I need to take? All these things, which some of those things may need to happen, right? Like if you are shooting your brother in the eye with a Nerf gun, we're probably gonna have to take the Nerf gun away because this is causing trouble. But what I'm saying is look at the hard things as a chance to die for new life to begin. This is a shift that I'm always trying to make in my mind. It is not something I have down. Please no one think that I just walk around here so saintly because I don't. But it's a phrase that comes to mind all of the time. And it's from a poem from Wendell Berry. But he has this line, practice resurrection. And it's stuck with me that I'm going to have to choose to die in order for there to be life in my home. And motherhood is an invitation to a tiny million deaths. And that's not a woe poor us, it's a wow. We have the possibility of doing really good work here because we have the invitation to die to ourselves and press into the hard thing in order to see life grow. So this could be choosing to do your mother academia when you've had a long day and you feel like it'd be easier to just zone out on, I wanna say TikTok, but I think my generation up, we're too old for TikTok, right? Like we're not on it right? Are we on that? New tip, don't be on TikTok. <laughs> okay. Anyways, whatever it is, we all have our things, right? The easy kind of potato chip stuff we can do in life. Um, but it could be the hard thing is choosing to do this, continue to work that muscle. The hard thing could be choosing to sit with an upset child on the couch holding them for a really long time. There are all these ways that we can step into reality as it is that will actually bring quietness to our life. I know you're thinking, how does that sitting with a 
the child bring quietness. But again, I think it goes back to that staying with reality as it is, pursuing the sometimes harder but often better thing as it's happening. And in doing that, we end up not filling or escaping as much. And that's kind of the thing there. When we practice resurrection, when we have a mindset that we are going to press in to the reality around us, to the things God has given us, because as I often say, if you wake up as a mom and you don't think you'll be teaching, and teaching is the definition of disciplining, if you don't think you will be teaching children all day, then you didn't wake up with any idea of the mission at hand. If you thought you were gonna wake up and everyone was gonna obey you all day, <laughs> it's gonna be great. It might be, but there also shouldn't be surprises when you realize you're spending 45 minutes leaning into teaching something. Um, I'm surprised by it all the time. So if you're like, well, I've never thought about that way and I do wake up surprised I have to discipline my children throughout the day, sometimes me too, but that's what we're doing. We're learning to practice resurrection. And in doing that, we are actually staying in reality, which allows us to build all that spaciousness, which allows ideas to connect, which hopefully, hopefully allows us to become like Christ. Okay, this one's really easy. It's the pursue quiet when you can. A lot of time, the go-to for moms is to pair listening to something with the more mundane tasks that fill up our day, right? We're gonna mop the floors, we're gonna wash the dishes, we're gonna fold the laundry, we're gonna make the beds. So I'm gonna pop something in my ears and go. And I'm not saying don't ever do that. I know that is a very um, good time for moms whose hands are full with really little kids to listen to something, but just don't do it all of the time. Ask yourself, am I always putting something on? I did that for a long time. I was just listening, 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 learning as much as I could, and that was great. I learned a lot. But at some point I reached this fever, fever pitch point of thinking, I'm always listening to something. I don't even know if I could narrate it back to you. I think I'm just consuming it like you would eat a bag of pretzels and at the end be like, what happened? Were those good? Did I, did I, hear, any, did I hear any individual pretzel talk to me? I don't know. So I would say just be mindful that you're not always listening to something. I think this there's a danger with the book let me hear thing. I see it every year when people tell you how many books they've read that year, which as I always say is no indication of if they read them well, so please don't be impressed, shamed, anything. Just take it as a piece of information and move on. I feel really strongly about that one because when someone's like, I read 382 books this year, 374 of them were audio, I do ask myself, was there ever quiet for you? to listen to that many books all year? Was there ever quiet? Because between your kids talking, this YouTube video talking at you, and then that many books in your ears, you're gonna have to ask, did I make room for actual learning in this? Was there quiet? So don't always fill your, your tasks with things in your ears. So the last two go together. Just remember, you have limits. You are a person. This is kind of the thing behind my whole dumb phone series, if you followed along with that, that you are a person. In our modern age, we're going to have to choose to limit ourselves because we have the privilege of so many opportunities. We can live well beyond our means, our creaturely means and limitations if we want to. It'll be to our detriment. We can see that it already is, but we have that opportunity should we want to take it. So with these two, the first is to spend more time with nature than with technology. That's the best I can do with that one. I mean, it is very basic, but we used to understand the world through the metaphors of nature. Now we use the metaphor of the machine to describe the world, to describe persons. We have to process things. I'm not a computer. I don't process like that. We have to program children. Children, not computers. You don't program them. You see what I mean? We have human resources as a department in work. Humans aren't resources, they're persons. You know, we have all these things like that. Um, but we used to think about things through nature metaphors. Now I haven't read it yet, but I love Joy Clarkson and I know she has a book like You Are a Tree and it's talking about these metaphors that we use. So I've caught bits and pieces and it sounds great. Haven't read it, but I'm sure it's as wonderful as I think it will be. Um, but she's exploring this idea if you wanna kinda of go further with that. Like what does it mean that we're more like a tree? We're not a machine. Um, anyways, that's the one. Stick more with nature than with machines and guess what you buy by default, we'll have a lot of quiet and contemplation space. Walking out by the trees, by the creek, out in a field, in your backyard, sitting in a chair while your kids are playing in the corner, that's also going to give you a lot of free, empty time to think, connect, and be changed by. Where when you're on a machine, you're usually taking things in. Machines tend to give us things, and we just passively receive a lot of them. Nature doesn't do that. The second part of that is to remember that just because you can find an answer, maybe don't. Just because you have a question doesn't mean you need to Google it. In fact, that Google is a verb is a pretty good picture of how often then we just whip out our phones, open up the laptops and try to find an answer. But that was not possible for most people for all of time. And it may just be a really good practice to pause and wait 
and not go find out immediately. Marvelous idea for the homeschool mom. He's like, but we can find out anything. Maybe just don't. Maybe just think about it for a while. Maybe just give yourself the chance to have to wonder, to have to be in awe, to have to be confused, to have to have possibly a hypothesis or their own answer before you go find out. And I think all of those together could be really tremendous for the mom who is trying to build out this space in her life. You don't always need the answer and you're not a machine. Go outside. All right, so now that we've kind of covered that, we're gonna do an update on my personal mother academia because you're holding me accountable. No, I'm just kidding, I'm holding myself accountable because I'm a grown woman. But I am gonna share with you how I'm doing this and how it's going. So here is what has happened. I've read other books as we all expected me to do. Um, the first was Grace, Dr. Grace Hammond, uh, Jesus Through Medieval Eyes. A lot of people sent me her podcast, which is Old Books with Grace, when I started talking about my medieval studies and my interest in the medieval age. I've really enjoyed what I've been able to listen to. And so this book came out and it was definitely on my radar, but then I happened to be in Barnes and Noble before a baby shower and was horribly dismayed at the book offerings in the Christian section at Barnes and Noble. So then this caught my eye though, and it was a happy, happy thing. So I bought it there and I'm not gonna go through each book and what I thought or anything, just because that's not what I do in this type of video. It's more of a mother culture video. But, um, so I read this one, just kind of happened kind of quickly. And then I also uh, signed up for Joshua Gibbs's webinar through Circe about classroom catechisms, which I write one for my kids each year. We are gonna start doing them at co-op next year. And that's why I signed up because I wanted to know about more of a classroom setting. And Cersei had this funny deal where if you bought the book when you signed up, you got a discount. I think the discount was $1.50, but thanks Cersei. Anyways, the book was great. And so I read something they will not forget rather quickly as well. I did finish Brideshead. I have so much to say about this but I can't say it right now. And then also my kids and I moved on to our next read aloud, which for us is Swallowdale by Arthur Ransom. We read Swallows and Amazons last year probably and loved it. And then I, first I started buying uh, this particular collection because I like the illustrations. Um, so we have most of the set now, but not all of them. And secondly, my kids do say Amazons, even though we were in the United States and it would be Amazons because they have picked up all this British sounding lingo. Um, like Python. They also say Python and ladybirds instead of ladybugs. They're very cute children. Okay, and then the last switch. Um, I was talking about humility last time in Latin studies and people were wondering what I was doing for English grammar as I add this to my rotation. I'm using Nancy Wilson's Our Mother Tongue. And this was recommended to me by Bethany Douglas. I interviewed her for season two about making our Charlotte Mason philosophy, our educational philosophy practical in the early years. It was a great interview, so I'll link it above. But she was kind to recommend this. She has already graduated one of her kids, so she has some proof in her pudding, and I've really enjoyed this. I actually keep it in my bag. Here's a tip. I keep this in my bag all of the time so that wherever I am, I'll do it at some point during the day because it's only a couple pages. So she actually, Nancy gave a, or I guess Canon Press probably published this, um, gave, an outline for a term for a teacher to follow. So I'm just following that. And I'm really enjoying this. So that's been helpful and great. And I think my English grammar is very poor and I'll want to edit everything I've ever said or written online when I finish this program. But let's get to the notion and check off what we finished that was actually part of my mother academia. Okay, my fine friends, let's roll on down here to my mother academia database that I have. I'm a big fan of this. So here you will see what has already been done. Nothing new there for you, but, um, well, I guess I did add some things in here. Okay. So I already had bride's head, Jesus through medieval eyes and something they will not forget, um, in here as done. We're going to make up dates for when I completed this. <laughs> and if you're a homeschool mom, you know how often we're like, yeah, that's about when that happens. So, so it's okay. All right, so Winters in the World, I am still reading um, as a recap. It's up here. I don't have it on the table right now, but I am reading along with the seasons. And so we have not yet switched into spring, so I've not yet touched it again, but I'm about to. Um, I did finish reading Tacitus. So we are finished here. That was a big one, as well as my Bible reading. Oh, see, I have it here. I do. Ha oh, I do have these things on the table. So I'm finished with these two. Um, I do actually have these on the table. They were both rather large selections. And so that feels pretty good to have finished those. And we're going to make up that I finished them. Let's see here. Wait, which one am I on right now? Mm, we'll say that. Okay. For Tacitus. And then the Bible was last month. We'll just say 26. Good. I'm an academic. Um, okay, and then right down here, we started some in-progress things. So let's see here. I did finish all of my Sophocles. 
so we can like check these off. And by this point, when I got to Sophocles, I had returned to doing my oral narrations for most of it. So that's good, or my oral, sorry, <laughs> my written narrations. The problem was that I was having to orally narrate because we were so sick and that was one of the gifts of humility for me. So that feels pretty good. We finished those. We'll say, we'll just put them on the same date, even though that's not how I read them. But I did find and meant to say in that last video that if you had maybe lost your footing with Mother Academia and you were having to resort to oral narrations when you wanted to do written, or your pacing wasn't that great, and you were in large books or large selections like this, that it was a conscious and intentional decision of mine to go to Sophocles next because I was reading the Theban plays. They're not very long. I've already read a lot of the Oedipus story, and so I knew I could get through them. Um, not that you were trying, that sounds so bad. It's not that you're trying to rush through them, but I knew that I could get a little pep back in my mother academic step, if you will, by doing something short where I could read three, three things on my list in probably four days because I enjoy plays. They're not long. The narrations didn't take a long time. And so it wasn't, I'm just going to rush through this to check it off. So I feel good because I checked something off. It was, I just need to kind of get my gears going. I need to feel like we're moving somewhere that I'm, I'm back on track. And I think that can be helpful. There's sort of like a mind game there. Um, let's see. And then do I have anything else going on right now? I think everything else is in here. Yeah. Swallowdale's in here. So next though, what do I want to do next? Well, I am taking the Davenant Hall class, as I previously mentioned when I talked about them as a sponsor, and that will be starting next month. Does that fit into my mother academic course, either of my, any of my courses? Not really. It's early church worship, but the early church shaped the medievals, obviously. So my mind will find a way to make that connect because I'll give it so much time for contemplation that it'll find the, the way I want to connect those. But that will be something obviously I'm working through. And so I may not put it in here or I may not narrate it in my notebook. I may just enjoy learning from it, but how so might. Okay, so what do I want to do next? I did, oh, I did start the discarded image, but I mean, I read a couple pages of it while waiting somewhere one day. So it's not, I haven't clicked it on. Okay, so where do I want to go next is really the question. If you found a way to figure out where you're going next on your journey, I would love to hear below because I've kind of left mine open-ended. Like, where am I going to go next? Technically, I still have these things in progress, right? The read-alouds to my kids, and if they would stop talking so much at bedtime, we would finish them more quickly. But those aren't really things I can, you know, keep focusing on with them if they're going to be chatty at bedtime. I could go to Odyssey and Confessions, but... A lot of my books came in and I want to read them instead. So I think I might listen to King Lear because Shakespeare, you you should always listen to it. If you don't know that, you should always find a great audio and listen to it. If you can watch it online, just watch, um, watch it be acted out. Or maybe I'll get lucky and Shakespeare in the Park this year will be, will be King Lear. It probably won't though. They usually do a comedy. Anyways, I think I might want to do the Divine Comedy next, or at least the Inferno, but that means I'm going to begin first with Dr. Jason Baxter's A Beginner's Guide to Dante's Divine Comedy, um, because I think he is fantastic. I would love to take a class from him, and so I do have a book. I have his book, and in that I just count it as a book, but I also have a category for tutors, and that's when I will choose an outside source to kind of prep me before I read a book or to read alongside with the book. I also have, I'm pretty sure I have Hillsdale on here. Hillsdale also has a Dante course and it's totally free. So I will probably work through his book and listen to that course, kind of like a podcast, like you would do a podcast. And then before I start reading the comedy, but I think I'm going to go there next. I'm just kind of in the mood for that. Although Arthurian romances may take my early early spring once we're outside all the time because who doesn't want to read a lovely romance under a tree? Okay, so that's where we're at. We're making some good progress here. I'd love to hear how your mother academia is going. Also, to remind you, oh goodness, when does this come out? Today's the 7th. So this comes out before the symposium, you lucky ducks. If you would like to join us in Common House this Thursday, we will have our first quarter symposium meeting where we shall bring libations and we shall bring fancy snacks, which I know are called hors d'oeuvres, if you want to. And we will be discussing ideas um, that we are learning about, that we are connecting for what we hear from other women, how this whole entire project is going, um, and the like. And you are more than welcome to join us. It's just for Common House, though, so go ahead and hop in there. And we will be meeting on Thursday. And I can't wait. I think it's going to be a really good time. Nerds unite. I'll see you next time.